Hello, everyone. My name is Lace Pedersen. I'm a technical artist here uh, at RenderMan at Pixar. And uh, today I have the luck to present one of our amazing developers uh, of RenderMan for Maya, uh, Philippe the Prince, who will be talking about his close collaboration with Industrial Light and Magic and uh, presenting and implementing uh, their layered material system called Llama, uh, which has been used in uh, Star Wars and The Irishman, among other films. Um, so to tell you a little bit about the format for today, we'll be talking, um, we'll be going first with our uh, showreel, which will give you a sneak peek at uh, the amazing work uh, done by Renderman Studios. And you'll also see some llama work, of course, with Star Wars and, and uh, The Irishman, so watch out for that. Uh, then Philippe will present, and then we'll be talking over some live demos to, uh, so you can see how it all unfolds um, in a more practical way. Uh, then we'll be taking uh, some questions. So make sure you uh, ask your questions in the questions tab and not in the chat because it gets very, very popular and it's hard for us to kind of sort through all that stuff. So without further ado, here's the Render Man showreel. So this is a sneak peek at some of the new shading features in Redman 24. Uh, we'll start with Lama, which is the next generation of materials. Uh, Lama stands for layered materials. It was developed at Industrial Light and Magic to replace their previous solution, a monolithic BXDF with a prearranged combination of lobes, uh, similar to Pixar surface. Main idea was to separate the lobes to create arbitrary combinations and make it easier to add new lobes whenever necessary. Lama is a node-based system with a small number of user-friendly nodes. It is currently implemented in Renderman RIS and Mari, and it has become a production proven tool at ILM. In Lama, you will find three types of nodes. The main DXDF that will be attached to your object, it renders nothing by itself, but controls the other connected Lama nodes. Uh, the layering nodes allow you to combine two nodes to build your material's final appearance. The BSDF nodes are the lobes that will respond to your scene's illumination. 
And this is what uh, Lama material looks like, a node graph. Uh, the highlighted nodes in the image are Lama nodes. The other nodes are regular patterns. In this case, we first combine a diffuse and a dielectric loop to create a shiny plastic, and then combine the result to add a layer of diffuse dust. In Pixar surface, the diffuse lobe is at the bottom of the stack. In this example, it is at the top. Uh, Lama brings a new level of flexibility. Uh, but there's, but now let's take a look at the main BXDF Lama surface. So Lama surface has only a few settings to control downstream nodes. It sets up the material per side, it controls the execution of some features, and triggers custom AOV evaluation. Let's take a look at the material setup. Uh, by default, we have a single-sided material. In this case, the number of sides is set to one, and a simple diffuse node is connected to the font material program. Now, if I set the number of sides to two, the same mat diffuse material will be used by the backside as well. But I can also connect a different lobe to the back material plug. In this case, it is just a conductor node, but you can, of course, have a full graph on each side. Uh, let's take a look at what Lama has to offer. First off, you get nine different lobes to allow building anything you need from hard surfaces to hair and fur. Then we have two ways of combining these lobes, horizontally and vertically. To give you a better sense of how much is available, let's take a look at each node. Lama Conductor is designed to create metallic surfaces. It has the usual controls like Fresnel and isotropy iridescence, as well as a couple of new features, full energy conservation and GGX tail control. Let's take a look. In our previous BXDFs, Pixar surface included, specular lobes suffered from energy loss at high roughness. Lama nodes implement microfacet multiple scattering using Emmanuel Turkin's technique. The result is perfect and fast. It is used by all specular lobes as well as the diffuse lobe as the RNIR algorithm suffers from a similar energy loss at high roughness. In the RNIR case, the algorithm has been tweaked to avoid oversaturating the colors which is problematic when your albedo texture has been painted from reference. Now let's move to the other features. Uh, specular haziness or tail control is a way to create a halo around a sharp specular response. This is often visible on metals or shiny dielectrics with micro scratches. In the past, artists often had to combine two specular lobes to achieve that effect and increased render times. Uh, the system combines two roughness values into a single specular lobe and at a minimal cost. It has the same look as the GTR lobe used by the Disney BRDF, uh, although the GTR lobe cannot be tweaked. Uh, let's go back to our node now. Lama dielectric uh, can be used for glass, varnishes, coatings, and so on. Energy conservation is a great improvement for first aid glass. <clears throat> it includes the usual controls as well as a long-awaited new feature, dispersion. This will make quite a few people happy, I know. Note that Lama Dietric offers more granular shadowing control than our previous offerings. Lama Diffuse is your classic or an IR node with better energy conservation. Uh, note that in many Lama nodes, the energy compensation slider allows you to tweak the look to match older assets that were not energy conserving. Lama emission, as usual, this is for low intensity emission like small LED screens. Uh, Lama subsurface scattering handles all subsurface scattering duties. It implements both of our pass traced subsurface algorithm as well as the Burley algorithm for uh, a different look. Sheen is used for cloth, pitch furs, and other microfibers scattering effects. This lobe is energy conserving as well. Uh, Lama translucent is evaluating back-facing diffuse elimination. It is typically used for tree leaves, paper, or thin cloth. Uh, it is a separate node to make double-sided materials more controllable and potentially output to a different AOV. Uh, Lama tricolor SSS is the other subsurface scattering node. Uh, this mode was introduced in Renman 20, and ILM likes its versatility. 
uh, they found it was useful to use tricolor SSS in some areas of a model and use LAMA SSS in the other areas. And that, it was, that is one of the big advantages of this framework, the ability to blend different subsurface scattering models in the same material. Um, this node implements Chang Hair model, which has been very successfully used by Walt Disney Animation, Pixar, and Island. It is energy conserving, efficient, and easy to control reproducing a wide range of hair and fur with just a few intuitive parameters. Lama Mix is our first uh, layering nodes. It is a horizontal layering node, which means that it blends two loops the same way you would blend two images. It is similar to the way you can blend multiple pixel layers nodes. Um, there are two modes normalized, make sure the resulting blend is still energy conserving, and additive, which lets you go crazy, but at your, at your own risk, of course. Uh, Lama stack is a vertical layering node. It means that we have a layer on top of a base material. If the top layer is transmissive, Lama stack can compute volumetric effects like absorption based on the top layer's thickness. This is a more physical way to combine two materials. To conclude this presentation, let's talk about ILM's experience with LAMA. The dev artist quickly adopted the new system as it offers unprecedented uh, flexibility. It also opens interesting possibilities to optimize some materials, but more on that another time. Performance has been great across the board, although one could imagine less skilled artists pining on lobes for no reason and significantly slowing the renderer. But in practice, with the same number of active lobes, performance is the same as a monolithic BXDF. Finally, ILM reconstructed their previous monolithic BXDF with LAMA to reuse old assets. This technique can, of course, be used to support other models like Disney's BSDF or Autodesk's uh, standard surface. And this is something that came uh, during the first session yesterday. And I made a new slide on that. Uh, this is an example where we have a simple metallic workflow because uh, Lama uses the same uh, albedo uh, and well, diffuse color and specular uh, as Pixar surface. So here you have the Lama nodes that reconstruct a, a very simpli a slightly simplified uh, Disney BSDF. And you have two Pixar mix nodes that allows us to uh, basically get exactly the same result with uh, the metallic thing. And at the bottom, uh, we have uh, the formula that uh, you can use uh, to uh, get those results. So uh, the textures were created with Substance Painter using a PVR metallic workflow. And um, it's quite easy to, to get exactly the same results. You just have a couple of extra nodes. Uh, so here this is, uh, a quick render I did this morning to show you uh, Disney versus Lama and it matches quite well. There are a couple of differences. The diffuse model are different and the Lama specular will look brighter at high roughness because it won't lose the energy uh, like uh, Pixar Disney does. So uh, Lama will be available in Randomant24 in Houdini, Katana, Mayan, Blender. We are actively working with ILM to improve and extend Lama for later releases. After 24, we will implement LAMA-based material exchange via MaterialX and USD. That means that we will be able to uh, ingest a MaterialX document and reconstruct your material using LAMA nodes. And of course, LAMA will come to XPU as it represents for us the future of material creation. Now we're going to move on to another important aspect of shading in 24. Uh, is the next step of our OSL adoption. So C++, C++ patterns are deprecated. All patterns are now written in OSL. We improved our OSL support to make sure we could translate our pattern library to OSL without any functionality loss. And that allowed us to implement exciting new nodes, but on that a little later. Um, 24 is using the latest 
uh, OSL 111 library, delivering all the new features people have been waiting for, including continued CMD execution for uh, maximum performance and compatibility with MaterialX standard library. Full OSL adoption is important to help our user transition to XP, where OSL is the only supported shading language. Note that closures are still not supported as we feel our C++ BXDA API still offers a lot more flexibility to advanced users. So this is one of the new uh, OSL patterns that we are going to release with 24, uh, the x tiling pattern. So what is it? It's a new way to seamlessly tie textures. So you take a seamlessly repeating texture, you tile it, and you wish you didn't see the repetition, but you do. Enter X tiling. The repetition is pretty much gone with the default settings. With a couple of tweaks, you can it can look really good. So how does it work? Uh, the white grid shows the texture grid. The idea is that you randomly pick hexagonal image areas and blend them together like so. Another hex tile and another one. The center of each tile contains unmodified pixels and each X tile blends progressively into each other. Uh, this is a visualization of the blending weights. It works really well with repeating textures that look pretty uniform. One of the key aspects of that technique in, is the blending between the tiles. It is designed to preserve the contrast in the blending areas. Let's take a look at a simple example. Here we have a PXR texture plus PXR manifold 2D on the floor and a PXR multi texture plus PXR round cube on the sphere in statue. Repetition is obvious. Here we replace PXR manifold 2D with PXR hex tile manifold and just enable hex tiling in PXR round cube. That's a pretty significant improvement with close to zero effort. Let's enable the grid and we can see I tile the object at different frequencies to get something I like. This renderer shows the contrast preserving blend in action. The colors are not faded and it is hard to tell where the blending areas are. Now I turn it off, the colors are more washed out uh, in the blending areas. Let's look at it again. The contrast is on, it's off. So it's not quite as contrasty and you lost a lot of uh, nice detail. Okay, another thing that we can fine tune is the width of the blend, which is useful for some type of pattern. Here we have a wide blend uh, between the hexagonal tiles and I will just move to the next uh, kind of width 0 0.5 and then zero. With this texture, you start to feel the hexagonal shape of the tile, so a larger blend works better. So I will step back 0 0.5, 1, 0 0.5, 0. And if you look at the top, you see kind of, you kind of start to see the hexagonal tiles. Another example, so it's just a, a flat texture on the plane. Uh, I just add some displacement uh, and normal maps and looks pretty okay. Uh, note that Pixar Run Cube can now handle normal maps correctly as well. Uh, another last example. Oh, yeah, and another one. <laughs> it is a really effective technique that will uh, save a lot of time. Uh, so next feature, uh, phase of noise. Uh, it's a new type of noise uh, that was uh, presented at Seagraph uh, last year and used by ILM to look Dev Pasana the, in uh, the Rise of Skywalker. Uh, they used it for the sand dunes and a number of other effects. It's, there is a really vast texture space to explore and we ship our studio's implementation, which has a lot of nice features. So phase or not, what is, what is it really? Um, it creates, uh, imagine, wave-like patterns that can be oriented and distorted in many different ways. Uh, the waves can have different shapes and morph into each other. It works a little bit like Gabor noise, but also has contrast-preserving features that prevent the grayish areas you can sometimes see in the Gabor noise. 
Uh, let's take a look at a few examples. As I mentioned, you can create a very wide range of patterns, uh, and phaser noise has a lot of control. Uh, you can choose different type of uh, wave shapes. Uh, you can orient them with a texture or with a fixed, orient, uh, fixed direction. Uh, you can modulate the wave's density in a lot of different ways. And you can use sophisticated fractal loops to add visual complexity. Uh, it's pretty amazing to play with. And it's so flexible, it's probably worth uh, a contest one day. Um, to finish, let's have this mandatory UI shot where you can see that there is a lot of parameters. So we will ship with a few presets to get people started. Another uh, cool feature of 24 uh, is that OSL allowed us to review our bump mapping workflow. So we decided to go with something quite different. Um, we took advantage of this new paper from Morten Mikkelsen, which redefines bump mapping as surface gradients. Uh, all bump techniques, uh, that is height and normal maps, can be formulated that way, and mixing surface gradients give predictable results with very little work. It works much better than in previous versions of Renderman. So our main bump mapping node is now Pixar Bump Mixer. It takes surface gradients as an input and outputs the final normal ready to use by your BXCF. Pixar Bump is still available, of course, for backward compatibility, and Pixar Normal outputs surface gradients as well. So where are the surface gradients coming from? Well, pretty much every node can output a surface gradient through a new NG output plug. Here is a, a quick demo. Uh, we directly use Pixar Whirly's NG plug to feed a, BXR, uh, a Pixar bump mixer connected to uh, Lama Diffuse and uh, Lama Dielectric. So uh, in practice, we just created a simple plastic uh, in Lama. Uh, here, I'm adding a fractal on top, and I'm just going back to my mixer and changing the amount of blending between the two until I like it. And then I can choose to uh, maybe invert the, uh, the noise to see uh, if that looks uh, a bit better. isolate one layer versus the other. Uh, all those things uh, become quite easy to do and uh, very predictable. Of course, you have three blending nodes. You have over, add, and subtract. So you can completely uh, mask some areas uh, to um, uh, just uh, bump uh, a small portion uh, with a texture. So to recap, we introduced a new workflow around Pixar Bump Mixer. This Many nodes can output uh, surface gradients to create a final bump signal. And it is more flexible and predictable than our previous implementation. Um, so this is it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I will uh, um, pass the uh, mic back to Lef. Great talk. I'm going to close uh, your presentation over there. Great. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna mix this uh, this section with the video for phaser noise and a bunch of other features with some of the questions from the audience so that we can uh, combine our time that we have left. Um, so one of the interesting questions for phaser noise and, and hex tiling, um, can you actually drive any of the new patterns with any uh, surface attributes, uh, prim bars or anything else? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, sorry. I think there was a connection problem. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, the, the question was, can hex tiling pick up frequency attributes off of the uh, mesh it's applied to, for example, or any other of the, of the OSL? Uh, yeah, potentially you can do that, yes. OK, cool. And is there any layering performance and advantage or disadvantage to using Llama, you know, for example, against the Disney BXDF or, or Pixar no, it's, Surface? It's the same cost. It's the number of um, uh, active lobe that matters. So uh, 
uh, if you uh, have a configuration of your PXR Disney that uses like mostly uh, diffuse and specular and sheen, for example, uh, it will have exactly the same cost as those three logs in my network, uh, Lama network. Sorry. Cool. And um, I mean, I was just uh, doing there in the demo some simple uh, sand there, but it it showed the uh, potential, right, of, of bump, and you can like combine flakes, for example, and any other kind of interesting nodes in the system. And you've wired uh, this new system, right, for uh, Pixar Texture and a bunch of other OSL nodes to actually get the normal, uh, the it's called NG now, into the bump mapping directly, right? So no intermediate step, right? Yes. What are the benefits there? So uh, we did talk about some benefits in speed. I think you were mentioning a 2x speed up in, in computing normals. Yeah, so uh, it's a bit faster, and uh, it's very easy to uh, take the output of uh, any node and uh, compute the, uh, for example, the luminance of that signal and use it to uh, compute a, a surface gradient, mm -hmm. and then uh, allow you know uh, pixel bump mixer to use that. So uh, it means that suddenly uh, you are not limited. Uh, the same way you used to be with pixel bump and pixel normal. Uh, another great advantage is that you, you can mix normal maps together, for example, and you get the correct result. Or right. you can mix different normal maps and bump maps, and uh, it works as expected. That's awesome. Well, we're seeing a little bit of open color I.O. here in your uh, new ACES workflow, which is super interesting, right? Um, I mean, you can currently use it in 23, but you have to kind of you know do a pipe um, uh, manually. We have some cool new uh, Bloom features here, which, which are interesting. You can actually output these uh, artifacts to comp, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there is a new Bloom filter that allows you to uh, you know, create blooming effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can output the, uh, the different layers separately if you want to recomp everything yourself. Um, uh, I have a couple of more questions here. Um, is Lama available for NCR version? Yes, it's it's going to be completely available for non-commercial, um, and it and it will be available in all bridge tools, uh, including Blender. Um, in fact, we might even have a little demo of it here. Uh, so stick around for that. Um, another question is: Does Lama allow a heterogeneous volumetric interiors controlled by, for example, an Open BDB asset? So at the moment, this is not possible, but uh, it is a general uh, limitation of uh, our uh, internal APIs. Uh, that's definitely on our list of things to do, but we can't do it at the moment. Another good one. What are the main differences between Llama and Material X? So Llama is uh, a number of nodes that allow you to create uh, a material, well, uh, a BXDF, really. So the, the response of your surface to light. Uh, Material X is a high level description. It's something that will say, oh, and I have a diffuse, and I have a specular on top, and I have a little bit of sheen, and I have all those nodes that will create patterns that will feed those things. And uh, it means for us that we can ingest, well, at some point in the future, uh, we will be able to ingest a Material X document and translate it into a LAMA network of nodes and patterns, and then you will get the same result as you know in another renderer. Um, so this is what we're, we're going to do in the, in the future, but Material X doesn't do anything by itself. It's just a description, and LAMA is the nodes that will be used by that description to talk to uh, random man. Another good question is, is it possible to layer other BXDFs over the new hair shader in Llama, uh, Pixar Chan? So uh, you, can, you can use you know, uh, any Llama nodes to layer uh, on top of uh, each other, uh, as, but you can't mix with a Pixar surface or something like that. It's not possible because they don't respond to the same uh, internal API. Um, but uh, you can mix all the Maya nodes together. Uh, some might not give you the expected uh, result because hair shading is something that's quite particular. But uh, you can completely have different um, uh, hair shading settings to have like uh, dirt on top of uh, clean hair and stuff like that. 
That's interesting, right? Because that's that's a completely new feature. So that's that's awesome. Um, does does Llama have an equivalent parameter uh, for Pixar Surface Diffuse exponent parameter? And I think who asked that question? But uh, so what we have is a roughness parameter, and uh, that's because it's a Norin IR model, and uh, that's 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 it really. Okay. Let's see another great question here. Does does Llama layering compute each layer independently, or is it, or is there interaction between them? For example, if the top layer was a path trace subsurface, would that affect another bottom path trace subsurface layer correctly, tracing through the top and scattering into the bottom layer? So uh, when when it comes to uh, mixing different subsurface uh, things, um, we are limited at the moment by the internal architecture to uh, only two, uh, as far as I remember. So, uh, and it means that they can be mixed, but if you don't stack them, uh, you will get correct looking result, but you shouldn't expect uh, energy propagation uh, between the, the layers. But you could mix, for some, uh, for example, a patch trace subsurface and a tricolor, right? If you wanted that kind yeah. of artist freedom for I don't know, an alien or something that's completely, in, you know, not plausible, you know. Yeah, or you know, the thing is, uh, in ILM's case, what they do is that often they have to do body doubles, you know, where you have a famous actor with a lot of pictures, and they need to match exactly under uh, a certain set of lighting conditions. Uh, the references, and they found that sometimes the subsurface scattering, when it's past traced, looks better in some areas with some kind of topology, and sometimes the tricolor will work better. So th that was the the reason why they they decided to be able to have those two nodes and be able to uh, mix them however they want. In practice, they can mix together uh, four different algorithms, which is uh, very very flexible. I'm going to go back a little bit here for XPU because I want to I want to uh, touch quickly on on the advantages of speed, of course, here and how this whole new paradigm of of uh, doing everything through OSL for patterns is really benefiting kind of this forward-looking uh, you know transition to our upcoming render. So, um, can you talk a little bit about what what the advantages for Llama and and OSL are for XPU particularly? So uh, the, the best thing about OSL is uh, that we write uh, the patterns once and it works in XPU automatically. There's nothing to do. So um, uh, you have to know that our support of OSL contains uh, a number of special specific things that are specific really to render man. Uh, so um, uh, it's not guaranteed that uh, some functionalities, if you write them for render man, will work in other renderers, but 95% or 98% of uh, the OSL shaders you write in render man should work in another renderer. Uh, but anyway, this freedom to write once and use multiple in multiple places is really great. Uh, Lama is not yet implemented in XPU. At the moment, we support uh, Pixar Surface and uh, Pixar Disney BSDF, which is the uh, the second uh, Disney BSDF, which has subsurface scattering and, uh, and uh, can do glass and all those things. Um, which you were talking about also at some point uh, in the past, I remember how um, Llama was just kind of more naturally, uh, uh, you know, better working essentially for GPUs because it provided kind of a smaller footprint per node um, in the code base, right? So then, like storing all these things instead of a monolithic shader is actually a lot better, right? Is that true? Yes, but th that means also that we need to have like a, an execution model for our BSDF that is uh, slightly different. So uh, this is why we haven't uh, implemented Lama yet because uh, this, you know, is like the second phase of our right. delivery. Uh, at the moment, we need to focus on delivering uh, for LookDev. Uh, using uh, Pixar Surface mostly and Pixar Disney BSDF. Uh, and then the second round will be uh, redesigning uh, the BXDF part, which has been done already uh, partially by Fran uh, to, um, to support Lama. Another great question is uh, the chromatic aberration effect on the glass. Does that mean we can separate uh, index of refraction uh, 
per uh, RGB value and blend them? Or is that done by just mixing glass materials and that kind of thing? No, you have a dispersion uh, parameter, basically. So uh, the idea is that you, uh, instead of computing the Fresnel for uh, a specific value, you compute it over a range of values. And the wider the range and the more dispersion you get. Uh, and uh, there's uh, an additional control to uh, desaturate or oversaturate uh, the dispersion effect if you want to. I found it super simple. It's a single slider, and it and the results are really great. So that was awesome to see. Um, how would uh, displacement uh, for double-sided models work? So at the moment, displacement happens in a separate execution pipeline in the renderer, which means that it has to happen before Lama runs. So it's part of the model of pipeline, not 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 part of the shading pipeline. Yes. So right. displacement basically takes your geometry and rebakes it displaced. And then this is what the renderer will use, what Lama will use. So uh, at the moment, there is no integrated approach to that. Uh, we could make it look as if there was one uh, by implementing a, a number of uh, layering uh, uh, patterns uh, for displacement. But you already kind of have that. So, um, you know, uh, it's just that you can't say, oh, this is a material that is displaced and another material is displaced and I'm combining them through my, uh, through right. Lama and, and then magically the displacement will combine. We right, don't have that. Because logically the, the displacement, if it comes in, it's going to come out of the other side, of course, right? In a single place, if you're only you know, doing the geometry, there's really no way around that currently, so. Yeah, um, you know, in the past there were tricks to uh, right. to, do, to do, you know, like double-sided displacement. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't support that anymore, I think, in the renderer. But, um, but you know, uh, it's an open question that's, too. That, yeah. That's definitely an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can we make rough boundaries between two mixing layers? I know you have uh, masking yep. and all kinds of other interesting things in there. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you if you mean like uh, a very grading, uh, gradual uh, blend, you know, over a, 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 like a ramp, you know, over a surface, yeah, you can do that. That's okay. Works fine. We'll take one last question. Uh, actually, one might have a question for uh, time for two. Um, let's see here. Does the hex tiling work with displacement? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they, uh, and I demoed it in, in the, some of the examples that were displaced. Uh, they were using the, the X tiling in displacement. Uh, basically, the displacement pool, uh, uses the same OSL uh, patterns. So anything you write in OSL to uh, uh, transform, you know, to create signals uh, is usable in displacement. That's interesting because uh, the next question I was going to ask was essentially about that. You know, uh, does that mean that we can drive texture coordinates with our own gradient data instead of being forced to use uh, a manifold? Uh, so you you can definitely uh, well you you need like a base manifold that then you can perturb. Uh, if you are using um, if you are using X tiling, it's possible to uh, drive it also with a gradient map that will allow you to. Uh, create, you know, uh, um, uh, non, you know, rectilinear uh, mappings uh, of your manifold. So uh, this is something that is used, for example, at Pixar to create a tree bark. You know, so you have like a texture that is just tree bark like this, and they create mm -hmm. uh, a vector field like this, and then the tree bark will look like that. Interesting. I think we're going to finish it off with one last question. Um, is vertical layering actually path traced between layers, or is there some different kind of approximation to get the interlayer scattering? So uh, it is not doing the interlayering layer scattering. So there is an energy loss. Uh, it's using the you know the kind of classic. Um, uh, uh, layering that has been uh, described by uh, um, what's her name? Um, oh, I draw a blank. Anyway, sorry. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, we basically we are not modeling the light transport uh, that is 
well, the light that is interreflected uh, between the layers. Uh, this is something we looked at and we would like to have in the future, uh, but there isn't a good, quick algorithm that, that doesn't have, you know, a lot of drawbacks in terms of- A bit of, penalty, right, yeah, right. Yeah, that's speed, but there are also some that require, you know, a baking phase, uh, things like that. And we haven't found something that works well with anisotropy and yeah, there's a lot of restriction at the moment. So we don't think it's uh, quite ready yet, but as soon as we can find something, you know, we will definitely look into it. Awesome. Well, I want to appreciate everyone's comments, uh, great positive attitude and, and amazing questions. I hope that, um, yes, follow the, the link. Uh, there's a great new session starting right now. You have to get out of this page and go into that new one. So make sure you don't miss that for the women in RenderMan. And I just want to say thank you to Philippe for being with us. And um, I'll see you next time. Thank you very much, everyone.